joining. Um, uh, but thank you for being here. And we have uh, Wesley's making sure we get a good recording and Sean is standing by to talk to you. Um, but what I'm gonna do is go through my presentation and then we're gonna leave lots of time for questions, or at least I hope we will. And so if you have questions, get those ready and we shall proceed. I love this quote from Patrick Schwartbegger. Uh, he had a new book that came out in January called Anarchy Inc. And he says, those who approach the future with excitement are playing offense and positioning themselves for opportunity. Those who approach the future with fear are playing defense and worrying that new business models will displace their own. We have music in the background. So, anyway, so the, the thing about looking at the future is you have to take action. You can never just be um, passive and let things happen. And making changes in your business is a huge, huge piece of that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. For those of you who are new to me, I'm the author of several books, including Managed Services in a Month. And uh, of course, that's the, the book that we're sort of focusing on today is making that transition to Managed Services. Uh, but I have lots of other books and I would love to connect with all of you on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff. And uh, if you're interested in following up, there's my uh, address at smallbizthoughts.com. Today's webinar is brought to you by Zeitzel, and uh, they have a great uh, product line that you're going to hear a little bit about at the end of the uh, webinar. So stay tuned for that, and uh, Sean will be joining us. So today we're going to talk about kind of where we're going, and you know, there's always a changing, shifting environment for business. So you know, this message isn't the same as it was a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, we're going to talk about what is managed services and what is break fix. And actually, as odd as it sounds, making those definitions is more important today than it used to be. Because it used to be that everybody knew uh, what uh, tech support was, and it was break fix. And then uh, people started using this term managed services and now clients have an impression of it that may not necessarily fit with reality. So we're going to talk about what we mean by managed services and of course talk about preventive maintenance and getting the right tools for the job and then we'll have some Q&A. So uh, managed services is one of these things where uh, for me, the, the key elements are that we're going to focus on having a service agreement. We're going to focus on having predictable revenue. And we're going to focus on, you know, from the, the consultant's perspective, guaranteeing that you have a certain amount of uh, recurring revenue. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's delivered on a flat fee. And that is the one thing, if I were to say the one thing where people get many services wrong, it is that they equate it with a billing model, right? Uh, some people, too many people, actually provide what I would call break, fix tech support, but they want to move to a flat fee model and call it managed services. And there's much, much more to it than that because the focus needs to be on uh, the, the actual way that you deliver services. So the, the flat fee is a good thing and I support it and I encourage it, but it is not part of the fundamental definition of managed services. So when we look at break fix, um, a, a lot of people will say, uh, well, I am an IT service provider or I'm a managed service provider. Um, I don't know anybody who says I'm a break fix service provider, um, but they say that they are um, in, in computer consulting. A lot of people get into this and there's no reason when somebody's new to this industry to even know what the term managed services means. If you take those words apart, they don't really mean anything. It's just a term that we've come to use. So 
a lot of people say, well, I'm a computer consultant, right? Um, but you should be a managed service provider. And the, the fundamental reason is that it is a business model that will last you. It is a business model that is sustainably profitable. And, you know, going forward, it's something that is going to make you a bunch of money down the road. Um, so just remember that the, the um, uh, when, you, when you talk about managed services, you have to remember that it is not it's just a different way of billing, okay? That's super important. So when we look at the way that we divide up the money, different people have different ideas about how we do what I would call hourly or labor on demand. Um, so, for example, I have always been 100% managed services. So when we started out, obviously it didn't exist. But then when we, when we moved to managed services, we moved completely. And eventually, I wouldn't take any clients who didn't sign a managed service contract. And so they would buy all of their labor prepaid and they would, they would pay a flat fee and I would deliver certain services. And then only if something weird happened, would they get an extra invoice for the break fix part or the hourly service. Other people, for example, I've got a, a guy who used to be a coaching client of mine that he focuses on dentists. Dentists spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on equipment and it comes with lifetime service. So when they buy a desktop computer, they think that's the way it should be. And of course, that's not the way it should be because you know an x-ray machine and a computer are unrelated, but they are less likely to pay big money for a flat monthly fee to support their stuff. So what my friend does is he gets them on a very small managed service contract and that small piece is a flat monthly recurring revenue fee. It gets them uh, a certain amount of stuff but it doesn't actually cover most of their labor. And the result is that we might bring in the same amount for an average client with say 10 users, but mine's gonna be 90% managed services and 10% hourly labor. His is going to be uh, about 20% flat fee services and about 80% hourly labor. So you, you can divide up the pie however you want, but the managed service component has some very specific things that it does. So it used to be that we did, you know, what, what we now call break fix, you know, support on demand, which is basically, I would even argue it is in the 21st century, it is no longer a good way for clients to receive services. Like if a client has a choice, they would never, they should never choose downtime. They should never choose to be in pain and uh, having problems with their computer systems. We literally are capable today of creating systems that don't break, that don't get viruses, that don't have problems. And we do that with preventive maintenance. So in the old school uh, break fix, basically you wait till something breaks, then you rush over there and fix it. And so, um, that's why I say it's, it's almost unethical because it's based on having your clients be guaranteed, you know, I'm going to sell you tech support in a way where you're guaranteed to have downtime. And as long as you're cool with that, you know, by all means, that's what we're going to do. And so, you know, if you think about it, the, there's a bigger, bigger picture, obviously, than what we can cover in this seminar, but you can sell top of the line, business class equipment with a three-year warranty that doesn't break. And as long as clients don't try to make that machine last six, eight, 10, 15 years, then, you know, when they replace it and they've always got machines that are always under warranty, stuff stops breaking. And then if you patch all the holes and everything is patched and fixed and updated, well, you don't get viruses. Viruses by definition come in through an unpatched hole. And, you know, there's always 
we, we're always discovering new holes that need to be patched, but basically uh, you can essentially have machines that are trouble free, but it costs money, right? And so there is a difference, um, but if clients go with break fix, they are truly choosing downtime. And I have had people in this industry tell me that, uh, you know, oh, I don't use a remote monitoring and patch management system because it, it would fix a bunch of problems if everybody's stuff was, was updated and I wouldn't make money. And that is exactly the wrong mentality. You know, you don't want to have a mentality that you want your customers to be broken in order for you to feed your family. You, you know, the, there's an old joke I used to tell about how my competition had a, a closet full of pillows. And every Monday morning, they would take out the pillows and they would kneel down and they would pray that their customers' computers would break so they could feed their families, right? That's not a good business model. It's not, it's not good for you in the long run and it's not good for your clients. And you know, part of this is the simple math that you can only bill so many hours in a month, so many hours in a year. And you can uh, stretch it and, and fool yourself and, and tell yourself that you're gonna be 100% billable and all that, but the reality is that you will probably be 50 to 60% billable because you gotta spend time driving around, you gotta spend time on sales appointments, you have to spend time uh, educating yourself. You know, there's a lot of time when you simply can't bill for your time. And if you have uh, technicians, uh, a good technician will be 60 to 70% billable, and if they do 100% remote work, they might even be 75 or 80% billable. But at some point, uh, nobody's ever 100% billable. And if you're doing break fix, you are trading dollars for hours. And, and no matter what you do, trading dollars for hours, there is an absolute limit on how much money you can make. When you have automated processes, then the, the limit goes way, way, way up, right? You can serve many, many more endpoints, many more clients without having to put out extra money uh, once you get away from the break fix model. So the key to success is that managed services is focused on preventive maintenance. And this is the thing that a lot of people miss. A lot of people, they wanna go from break fix to manage services. And then they find clients who say, uh, why would I do that? I'm getting everything I want and the, you just wanna charge me more money on a flat fee. Well, here's the deal. You, you have to have an intermediary step. You have to start doing the maintenance. And early on, if everybody's on break fix, you're gonna charge them and how I got started with my first managed services deal is that I literally started doing monthly maintenance on every server and I did regular maintenance on every desktop. And back in the day, that was very manual because we didn't have RMM type tools. So <clears throat> eventually I figured out it's probably an hour to an hour and a half per month on average is what it takes me to properly maintain a server and verify the backups and check the logs and all that kind of stuff. And then about 15 minutes per desktop per month. So I just started doing those things on a regular basis and got clients to be reliant upon that. And then their systems worked better and better and better and things stopped breaking and they stopped having problems. And you've all seen this, the client that on the day that they sign with you, their big complaint is that uh, a machine <clears throat> that they need, uh, critically important, randomly reboots once or twice a day. And then a year later, they say, oh, no, no, you, you can't reboot the server except during lunchtime or after five o'clock because they are now, you know, completely uh, used to things just working because they're being patched and fixed and updated all the time. And that's the difference between preventive maintenance and break fix. Um, now, in terms of the whole business model, we bill on the first day of the month. So we ding the credit card, you get all your money on the first day of the month, you monitor everything and you keep it patched and fixed and updated and it just works, right? The way that it's supposed to. And so 
that is the goal of managed services. And so once you put the preventive maintenance in place, then when you make the move to managed services, you say, look, you know, I have been consistently spending this much time here every month. Things have stopped breaking. Everything is good. And now I want to move you over to this flat fee because now it makes sense. And you can also say, look, we've invested in these tools. We have a, a system for ticketing. We have a system for patch management, right? We've invested in, in tools and processes that make it possible for you to have this amazing system. And, you know, with the discussion about managed services, there are clients or prospects that you'll go into and they'll say, oh, I know what managed services is. You're going to show me three plans and you're going to want me to pick one and I'm going to want to pick the cheap one and you're going to want me to pick the most expensive one. So why don't I pick the middle one, right? And that is completely the wrong approach. You want to talk all about maintenance. You want to talk about preventing problems. You want to talk about uptime and then say, and the cost of that is this, right? And um, so it, it takes a while to get people to have the right conversation and to not let them tell you what your managed services looks like. So with break fix, whether you like it or not, you start every month with zero dollars in the bank. And even though you have a bunch of clients and they have a history of having paid you a bunch of money over time, there is absolutely no guarantee that they're going to have a problem or choose to spend money next month. And I will tell you, um, more than one person um, has had the experience that when the economy goes down just a little bit, the people on break fix, they simply say, no, nope, don't come in this month. No, nope, no, nope, we'll, we'll, we'll live with it. You know, that printer doesn't really need to print, you know, that much. Uh, and the people on many services, they say, oh man, you know, things are tough, but you know, we got a contract and it just is what it is. And they might drop a desktop here or there, but they don't drop the contract where people on break fix can literally just turn off the spigot instantly uh, when they have any problems. So with break fix, a lot of people uh, invoice in arrears, which means you go out, you do the work, you send somebody an invoice, and they, for whatever reason, we magically give people 30 days credit. <laughs> and then uh, with luck, they pay on time. So if they pay on time, that's cool. But in the next 30 days, you will have paid your rent once, you'll have paid your electric bill, you'll have paid your internet, you'll have paid your employees twice, right? So you're out of pocket for providing this tech support. And there's a huge factor a lot of people don't think about. When you are the bank for your clients, it limits how fast you can grow because you can't suddenly take on two more clients and provide a bunch more support and end up hiring another technician when nobody's given you any money. So you're always a month behind in collecting your money with managed services you get that money on the first day of the month and it's, it's, you know, let's just assume it's the same amount of money, but then you pay your rent and your electricity and your internet and so forth and so on. And then you get to keep the money that's left over at the end of the month. Um, not only that, but once you put in automated tools, you, pro you, you use less labor to provide the same amount of service. And so, you don't have to spend as much money on technicians or as much of your own personal time. And so you get to keep more of that money at the end of the month. So the, the most important tool you need to make this happen is an RMM. So a remote monitoring and, and management tool. And th this literally is the be all and end all, you know, the, if we didn't have RMM, it wouldn't be possible to provide modern, tech support, right? So lots and lots of people have an RMM tool at their disposal, but they haven't deployed it fully or they don't use it completely because it, it literally, just, just installing it on a machine, it it's, makes problems go away. And so it reduces the labor if you are you know, still on that break fix model. And I would tell you, 
as silly as it sounds, some people need to be told. You never, ever, ever give away the RMM. You don't install it for free. You don't, you don't even do monitoring for free because that is money going down the drain. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that happens is uh, that some people will say, well, let me just deploy this and you'll see how great it is. And then they, you know, the tool automatically fixes a bunch of problems, patches it, everything and uh, away you go. And then the clients will want like, now I don't need your services. So you need to make that part of, of what you do. Um, and one key element here is that the R stands for remote. So the more work you can do remotely, the more profitable you're gonna be. A lot of people here don't charge a fee to roll a truck. They don't charge a free fee to, to drive across the county. Um, and so they have a lot of time that's spent unbillable uh, moving from one client to another. And if you can do that stuff remotely, it really makes it possible to you know, increase how much revenue you can get per client. The other thing is, uh, once you get clients who are hooked on uptime, then you have to figure out, well, when can I work on their systems? Because I don't want to work, you know, 12 hours a day. Uh, I'm a big fan of work-life balance. So, you know, we, we, you know, we're basically available to clients from about 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. So if I need to, I can use what I call golden hours. So there, there's, there's a golden hour before the client gets to work in the morning, and there's a golden hour after they go home. And for some clients, there's a golden hour at lunch when basically you can remote in and fix a bunch of stuff, reboot their desktop or whatever, uh, and you're not stepping on, on their work day. And you just have a technician who comes in an hour early or comes in an hour late. Uh, and so you've covered those golden hours without having to pay overtime but that's only possible if you can come in remotely. And you know, there's RDP and other things that um, are actually, well, one of the biggest security problems today is people using RDP and not having good passwords and you know, basically punching holes in their clients' systems. So uh, an RMM tool is gonna be encrypted, it's gonna be secure, and it's gonna be able to, because it calls from the inside out uh, it's going to allow you to get into a lot of systems that you have some trouble with using uh, older means. Um, and you also need to set up the patch management. And to be honest, most of them today are so good that you could delay patches and you could vet your own patches. But for the most part, if you let the RMM tool determine which patches are ready to be deployed, and then you, you know, maybe you'll wait two days or three days, but go ahead and, and let them deploy. The, the, the way to day or two approach is good when Microsoft, you know, pushes an update that makes Outlook open in safe mode, <laughs> which, you know, happened a couple of years ago. You know, stuff like that, you can avoid that. Um, but also the RMM, once you learn a little of their scripting, It'll allow you to go out there and uninstall that patch from all of those systems instantaneously and then reapply it uh, once Microsoft's got a new version. Stuff like that allows you to do massive amounts of work across all of your clients without spending much labor. And so one of the things you have to remember is you will charge your client based on the value of your services, not the number of hours you put into getting this done. So if keeping a server patched, fixed, and updated is worth an hour to an hour and a half a month, then that's what you're gonna charge them. Uh, and then you're gonna use tools so you don't have to spend that labor. You get it down to basically verifying the backups and the rest of it is done instead of once a month, it's done every 60 seconds by the RMM tool. And so you've saved a massive amount of labor but provided the same kind of service. And so the price doesn't need to go down. The price can be exactly what it was before when you were charging by the hour, but now you're doing it in an automated way, providing a higher level of service and getting prepaid for it. <clears throat> um, the other tool you need is a PSA. So a professional services automation tool, which is something where usually this is where your 
<clears throat> ticketing system is. Eventually, you'll put your client contracts in there so uh, you can automate a lot of the backend stuff. Uh, I always sign one contract with the client, which I call the managed service contract, but I put two contracts into the PSA. Everybody has a time and materials contract because not everything is covered by managed services. And then the people on the managed service agreement, they have a managed service contract in the PSA. So if a ticket comes in and it's covered, it automatically goes on to the managed services contract. If a ticket comes in and for whatever reason, it's, it's an ad move change, then it goes on to the billable time and materials contract. So um, that's just a way where you can easily make sure that the, the tickets that are supposed to be billable are billable and the tickets that are not are not. Um, and you know, if you have both kinds of clients, then basically somebody who's not on managed services, everything is billable by default, unless there's a good reason for it not to be. If somebody's on managed services, everything's not billable by default unless it's an ad move change. And so you just make those distinctions. And it, if, you, if you set up the contracts right in your PSA, your technicians don't have to make decisions and your front office doesn't have to make decisions about whether something is covered or not. It's all done by the service manager, basically. <clears throat> Uh, and finally, you need some kind of financial tool. Most of us use QuickBooks in the small business space. Uh, it will integrate into these other systems. A good PSA will integrate with the RMM so that you know how many machines are deployed and how many licenses are deployed. QuickBooks works with the PSA so that uh, you generate your invoices in the PSA and then they just get matched up in QuickBooks. So. Um, it, it makes life much, much easier. Again, you're, you're automating your own processes the way that you've helped your clients automate their processes. So those are some of the tools that you need. Now, the other thing is that you want to look at, um, you know, your service area, you know, and say, uh, do I want to have a uh, an area that is um, included for free, that I'm going to travel out there for free, uh, what are your minimums, that kind of stuff, and all of those things get put into the PSA. Now, you also need um, a good business plan, which doesn't have to be a big fat document. Uh, my friend Jim Haran wrote the book, The One Page Business Plan, and uh, and I'm a big believer in that. You, you have to have some idea where you're going. You know, you're Unless you're going to the bank to get a big fat loan, you don't need a big fat business plan, but you need to have some idea where you're going. You also need good processes and procedures. You know, uh, processes will save your life <laughs> um, because at the end of the day, you can't control human beings. You can't control clients, you can't control employees, but you can control your process. And I'll give you a very good example. On the sales side of things, I never want to talk about money till the third or fourth meeting. But there's always clients who say, oh, send me a quote. No, nope, that's not my process. I don't do that. I want to do an analysis of your network. And then I want to talk to you about what kind of services we offer. And then uh, I want you to agree on, you know, the kinds of things that you would have us do. And then I will hand deliver a quote. I will not email it. I will not fax it. I won't send it by yak train. You have to meet with me. A decision maker has to meet with me. And if they say no to that, I can just say, look, I, I'm not going to do it any other way. I can control my processes. And I, to be honest, I have never emailed anybody uh, an invoice or a, a quote for managed services and have them sign a contract and become a customer. I've only ever had them become a customer in person. So I lose nothing by following my process. So, you know, that's one of those things where you can control processes about uh, minimums and travel time and putting your time into the, the tickets and, you know, whether it's clients or employees, processes and procedures are what make your company your unique brand. 
And of course you need service agreements. And I'm just, I'm in the middle of teaching a class on service agreements. One of my other books is on service agreements. And, you know, basically the service agreement isn't about the service you deliver. It's about the relationship with your client. And, you know, it, it, it's also your relationship with the federal government and the state government with regard to taxes. Um, you know, so that's, that's just the way it is. And everybody needs to sign a contract, period. End of story. It's the 21st century. That's what we do. Um, and of course, then you need to have great products and great services and great partners. You know, there are people, <laughs> cracks me up when I see people on Facebook sometimes, they, they're, they put up these things and they say, oh, anybody know where I can get, you know, refurbished laptop batteries? And I'm like, oh my gosh, how many nickels do you need to squeeze, right? If you sell junk, you are going to get bit. It's just a matter of time. If you sell top shelf stuff, everything's going to work smoothly. So, you know, it, it is literally possible today to build systems that just work. They don't work without maintenance, but they do work. And, you know, we, we can build these beautiful systems. But you got to choose the right partners and, and, and sell the right products and services. So, you know, when we look at where we're going, um, th there's kind of this uh, series of events that I lay out in the book. You know, start by making a plan, create your, you know, three-tiered price list, and uh, as kind of a side note on that, I, I could go on for two hours on how to create a three-tiered price list. The most important thing is the price list should be created strategically so everybody chooses to be platinum. The people who can barely afford your services might go with silver. And in a perfect world, you will never sell a gold contract. Gold only exists so people can say, Wow, it's just a little bit more to go to platinum. I should do that. Uh, so anyway, create your strategic three-tiered price list. And you're going to get the books, so you're going to see my entire discussion about that. Um, and then you need to weed your client garden. And again, this is one of these things, I get a bunch of feedback from people. Oh, I can't afford that. Carl says I should get rid of these tiny little clients that only give me $300 a year, but I need $300. And I got to tell you, your time is better spent trying to find a good client who will sign a recurring revenue agreement for $1,000 a month than it is to go chase after these people who, you know, only give you 300 bucks a year. They don't even know that, that you think they're, they are uh, your client. You know, they think you're just the IT person and they'll call you when they need you. But most of the time, they don't call you because they don't need you right? You cannot build a growing business that will last 30 years on those clients. You literally can't do it. There's just not enough money there. So you may think you need them, but you don't. So you really seriously need to weed your client garden and focus on the clients who will help you build a business that will make you wealthy. Then you got to finish putting together your plan, write up your service agreement, have it reviewed by an attorney, um, you know, print up that pricing plan, set your client meetings and slide that contract across there and say, I would love to get started today. And I think platinum is the plan for you. Um, and then of course you need to, you know, review and acquire um, those tools, RMM and PSA, and you got to make sure all of that stuff is in place. So the, the key for me on managed services is that it covers the maintenance of the operating system and software. So uh, that means ads, moves, and changes are not covered. Hardware is not covered. And, you know, you, you have to avoid this all-you-can-eat mentality. There is no such thing as all-you-can-eat. All-you-can-eat, all the client can eat, is all of the profit of your company. So don't use that phrase. Don't let your technicians use that phrase. Don't let your clients use that phrase. You know, don't even let people on Facebook use that phrase. There is no all you can eat. If you think that all you can eat exists, go to an all you can eat restaurant and read the rules. Everybody has to order the same thing. There has to be a minimum size order. There's no takeout food. You can't waste food or we're going to 
charge you an extra amount of money, right? There's a long list of rules <laughs> for all you can eat because there is no such thing as all you can eat. That's just a sales tool that gets people in the door. Um, in the real world, managed services is focused on maintenance, you know, and everything else is add, move, change. Once you give the client maintenance, there's a lot less labor to be sold in the add, move, change department. Uh, and when they do choose to have you add something or put, put a new user in or whatever, well, then there's a reasonable fee and it is what it is. So uh, I get people asking me, well, are we post managed services? Is it a thing of the past? Is it gone? Is that an old business model? And I'm just telling you, this is the business model for the rest of your life. Everyone is going to be able to get these tools and be able to provide flat fee services on an ongoing basis. This just is the way that service is delivered today. Um, and that means that, you know, you have to step up your game. And if you focus on charging a little bit of money and hope that if you just work enough hours, you're going to make enough money, I'm just telling you that business model does not work. And uh, I know that there'll be some questions, but now I would like to introduce my friend, Sean Rogers, who is here from Zeitzel, and uh, he's gonna talk to us about uh, the Nebula products. Hi everyone, um, this is Sean. Hopefully you can all hear me out there. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping real quick. If you have questions for Carl, or if you have questions for me, um, to do the Q&A, use the Q&A tab. Do not send the questions in via chat or by raising your hand. Uh, click Q&A and type the, that in there. So anyway, um, my name's Sean. I am our market development manager, which is a fancy way of saying product manager for our Nebula line of cloud-managed networking equipment. Um, I want to talk briefly here. You know, Carl's just spent this, a lot of time here talking about managed service providers. Um, I've been working at Zycel now for 15 years. And before that, I was working also in the industry. Um, and this is something that we are absolutely seeing from our side of things. Um, we're seeing more and more of our partners move into managed services. And those that do um, seem to be growing at a much faster rate than those that still consider themselves just a VAR or just a consultant. Um, I've got some slides here to go through Nebula for you. Um, I'm going to do these pretty quick. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm sure you've got questions for Carl that you want to ask. So I'm just going to provide sort of a high-level overview. Let's see if I can advance the slides. There we go. So just briefly about Zycel. Um, we've been operating here in North America for 30 years. This is our 30th anniversary. Um, we've been making network products since day one. Um, we've got a number of firsts under our belt. We were the first ones out there that had a consumer grade router that had NAT, network address translation, way back in the day, just to give you an idea of how long we've been doing this. Um, currently out there, we've got over 100 million devices deployed in the field. The bulk of our business is actually selling to internet service providers and telcos, um, but we have been operating here in the channel and making products for VARs, resellers, um, businesses and users. We've been doing it for at least 15 years because we were well into this when I joined the company back then. Apologies, I'm having problems advancing the slides. Thank you, Carl. Um, so this next slide here is just going to be uh, talking about, you know, what, what uh, moving your network into the cloud does for you. So we're taking a look at what normally has to be done when you're deploying the network and how the cloud makes it different for you. So you still have to buy the equipment, whether you're talking switches, security appliances, wireless networking. Um, it dramatically, though, cuts down on the amount of time and effort that goes into installing the equipment. You no longer have to send somebody on site to do configuration. You don't have to do configuration before shipping it to the customer. Um, with most cloud managed equipment out there, it's literally plug it in. As long as you've got DHCP and power, it will reach out to the cloud and automatically download the configuration for that customer and that site. You no longer need monitoring equipment and software. Um, you can still use those if you want, if you've already got something you've invested in. 
Um, you know, with our Nebula platform, we still work with SNMP and Syslog, so you can still use that. But the cloud itself helps replace that and, and eliminates the need to buy something if you uh, don't already have something. You don't have to worry about setting up VPN access or port forwarding to get remote access to the networking equipment so you can access it remotely. The cloud, again, takes care of all of that automatically for you. The cloud platform itself, at least with Nebula, also acts um, partially as your RMM, your remote monitoring and maintenance platform. Um, so you can use the, our Nebula cloud to be able to keep an eye on what's going on in that network so you don't have to buy additional software and configure that. Data storage, keeping those logs secured and recorded for you, um, that again is being handled by the cloud, so you don't need to set up a NAS or network storage to do that and back it up. In the case of Nebula, the, our professional pack offers a full year's worth of historical <laughs> logs, data, and audit information. Um, doing changes and updates, again, it, it's all handled by the cloud. Um, so you can set up schedules based on when you want and when you want firmware updates to be pushed out. Configuration changes are automatically pushed out through the cloud. So again, it simplifies things for you versus your traditional uh, computer network. Um, still got the basics. Whoops. Um, when it comes to uh, user device management, again, in the cloud, uh, we offer a cloud authentication database. So if you're just doing 802.1x authentication, you're doing guest networks, and wanting to authenticate users, that can all be handled by the cloud. You don't need to set up a RADIUS server um, or integrate it with your Active Directory system. So the main takeaway here is when you move your network management to the cloud, it ends up costing you less, both in dollar terms, because there's less software, there's less hardware you need to do, but also in man hours and time that you put into it, because the setup, installation, configuration, and monitoring is simplified and made easy for you. So one of the key things that Nebula uh, offers for you here is setup without unboxing. All of our Nebula equipment includes a QR code that's found both on the unit itself and on the box. So you literally just scan in that QR code, assign it to your customer, and then ship the equipment out to the customer. Once that equipment is plugged in, it will reach out to the internet. It will see where it's supposed to be, which of your customers has that device, which site of that customer has that device, and will automatically download the configurations and update the firmware um, based on who that customer is for you. So it makes it super, super simple. There's no additional hardware or software that you need to buy. Um, our switches, our access points, and our security gateways in the Nebula line um, all are interfaced through this Nebula cloud interface, which you can access from any device that's got a web browser access. It's all done through the same pane of glass. And it's designed so you can see at a quick glance exactly what's going on with all your customers and all their networks. We've designed the Nebula Cloud interface from the ground up with the idea of uh, managed service providers. So we make it really easy to get an overhead view of what's going on on all of your customers, drill down to each customer on a site level, and then drill down onto the sites themselves to get that information you need. And you can do that, again, anywhere you've got a web browser access. We also have our mobile app. So that can be used, as I mentioned before, using the mobile app to scan in the QR code so you can assign the hardware to uh, your uh, customers. Um, it also gives you the ability to manage your, uh, your wireless network, view what's going on in all of your customer accounts. We've also got some fun tools out there for the installers. So for instance, you can take photos of the equipment as you install it. That will be stored in the cloud. So if you have to send someone on site, you know, at six months, a year, or two years down the road, you need to do something, um, the installer who goes on site can easily get in there and see a photo of where that equipment is. So this is our last slide here on uh, Nebula for you. And just reiterating again, the idea behind this is basically when you're doing providing managed services, Everything you're doing these days is operating over the network. So it makes sense to expand your managed services into managing their network as well. Because if the network's doing poorly, other cloud-based and other solutions that are out there are going to be doing poorly as well. Um, so we make this super easy for you. I obviously haven't gone through all of the different features that we have here. Um, but, but yeah, we, we think you'll like it. Um, we've got a free demo out there. I'm not sure if we've got that up on our slide. 
slides here. No. So if you want to test Nebula out yourself, we've got a free uh, demo you can try. It's just at nebula.zycell.com. And you can log in and take a look at a live uh, simulated site, and you can play around with the interface and see exactly what you can do and how it works. Um, we think you'll really enjoy it. And with that, um, I think I'm handing this back over to Carl, and we'll start a Q&A. All righty. So uh, do you want to read, pick the questions and read them? We, we yeah, we're having some technical difficulties. Give me just a second. All righty. I do know that All one right, of the, the biggest problems that people have is that um, and I see this again on Facebook and other things all the time is people literally de 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 deliver break fix and call it managed services. And I think that's a, <laughs> that's a disservice to the clients as well as to the industry. Okay. We'll just start from the top of the Q and A. Okay. So Carl, um, I have a question from Howard. He asks, clients have no idea what managed services means. What terms should one use to describe, sell, and deliver the services provided to the client? So that is a great question because um, even if clients have heard of managed services, they have a misunderstanding of it. Um, we use, we literally called our superstar IT. Uh, I think it's important, uh, uh, again, as a friend of mine says, you got to name your babies, right? So you should create a, a name for your packages and, um, you know, talk in terms of what value the client's going to get out of it because they don't really care about your company. You know, nothing personal. You know, nobody, nobody cares what tools you use. They don't care how often you check this or that or, or how you monitor it. What they want to know is, that they're gonna have uptime and all of that. So I talk in terms of um, how we solve their pain points. You know, if you, you know, I love the network assessment as a way to get into a client's office uh, because they're gonna talk about their problems. And then when it's time for you to make your pre presentation, you say, okay, you told me that having this server reboot randomly uh, is a, is an ongoing problem. We will absolutely put an end to that, right? That, like if we do nothing else, that will be a thing of the past. Uh, or you told me that your employees are using these other resources and they're gobbling up a bunch of bandwidth. Well, we can clamp that down, you know, uh, disallow Pandora. There's a lot, lots of things we can do. And you talk in terms of whatever their issues are, um, even though, you're going to sell essentially the same service to each client. Um, you're going to sell it in terms of the problem they're having today. You know, it's kind of like when you buy a home warranty. One person buys it because they have an old refrigerator. Another person buys it because they know that that heating system is not going to last too long, right? But they both buy the same home warranty. And managed services is kind of a, a warranty system for their business infrastructure. Thank you, Carl. Um, when you when you weed out clients, do you just give them the option of going to a MSP style, or do you find someone else? So early on, I moved from taking anybody to taking people who had five users or more, and then eventually to ten users or more. Basically, in my opinion somebody's got to figure out a way to pay us about $1,000 a month, more or less, in order to stay a client. And so uh, I, I had some practice <laughs> with this. Um, the, the most common thing I did was I would hand people off to somebody else who is a consultant I know in the area that I met through my local uh, SMB IT professional group, you know. Um, back in the day, they had the small business specialists and so forth. Um, nowadays, we just call it SMBIT professionals. <clears throat> but those folks, you know, there's plenty of people who they want smaller clients. They want, they're happy with break fix. They, you know, they don't want to grow their company and, and uh, you know, create recurring revenue. So uh, there's always somebody who will take them. Um, and so eventually when we moved to managed services, we did say, um, 
we're moving to 100% managed services. So um, yes, you've got a contract, but um, if you don't go to managed services, then we'll have to help you uh, find somebody else to give you tech support. And you know, a lot of people get freaked out about this turning down money, but in reality, you can build a business based on your ideal clients. You know, you don't have to, you do not have to pick up every nickel you find on the sidewalk. There's a lot of clients that they, they just aren't the kind of businesses that you can use to make your business a 30 year success. I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, Greg asks, what's the best way to get new managed service customers? Well, <laughs> for me, uh, even today, uh, my, my favorite things to do, uh, one is the network analysis, and that involves a constant marketing campaign to say, you know, bring us in, we will, you know, take a look at your network, and today, specifically, I would re really, really, really push an analysis of the network, not just the servers, but the whole network, because there's so much equipment, even equipment that's a couple of years old is gonna clamp down the network. There are people who are getting fiber and cable, right? And they've got these 250 meg plans, but they have uh, an external port that's 100 meg. Well, they're never gonna get 250, right? So going in and just doing a speed test on the inside of their router to determine if they're getting what they're paid for. And then inside the switch, inside the firewall, you know, click, click, click all the way to their uh, wireless access point. Almost every client that you've ever seen, every, every prospect has a choke point that is making their network slow. And then you can do the analysis of, you know, how much traffic is going out to, uh, you know, this person who is running a, um, a wedding referral business on the side and this person who is downloading streaming media all day, right? There, there's that kind of analysis and then giving them a report again in person to the decision maker, that's huge um, because it allows you to talk about their system, their problem, their company, their goals, what they wanna do. And when you make the conversation all about them, they think you're a genius. The more you talk about them, the, the smarter you look. The other kind of marketing that I love is to make presentations at local groups. Pretty much in any area of the United States, there are weekly meetings for uh, BNI, this networking group, that networking group, Kiwanis, Rotary, the Chamber of Commerce, right, the Enrolled Agents Association, right, on and on and on. They all need speakers every month. And if you put together a 20 minute presentation on your hot tips on avoiding viruses and, and um, ransomware, you will be able to give that presentation 10, 20 times a month if you want to. In some areas, uh, you can probably give it five times a day, <laughs> you know, but, but at some point you have to work for a living. But when you give a presentation like that, and then you, you say, hey, if you want my tip sheet, give me your business card, People throng to you, you give them their business card, you have a handout that's got your information and they, they Xerox it and everybody in their company puts it on their bulletin board. That's great marketing. And those are, those are two of my favorite ways of, of uh, getting new clients, always have been. Thank you, Carl. Uh, next question will be for Sean, uh, who is Jose asks, how does your hardware compare to Ubiquiti? Sure, it's a, that's a great question. Um, on a price standpoint, um, our access points are probably pretty comparably priced um, with our Nebula Flex line of products. So some of the things that we do a little bit differently, um, when we're comparing like to like, generally we're gonna have the better performance, particularly on wireless. If you wanna send me an email, I can send you over some performance documents um, that, that documents our performance versus uh, Ubiquity. Um, one thing we do a little bit differently than them is all of our business class hardware comes with a lifetime hardware warranty, um, where most Ubiquity products, I believe, are still at one-year warranty. We offer local live support out of our Anaheim offices here, so those people can be reached by a phone, email, or online chat. 
So we provide a lot better support on the back end than what you would probably get with a Ubiquity product. Our cloud offering offers a lot more features. Um, it's easier to set up. There's no configuration that needs to be done on the device itself. Um, if we're comparing this to Ubiquity, our cloud solution with Nebula is similar to the Ubiquity's Elite solution. Um, ours has, is a lifetime free cloud support, unlimited number of devices. There's no cap on the number of devices you can have. Um, so that, that's sort of how we compare to Ubiquity there. Um, our security appliances offer a lot more features, a lot more customization, something much more akin to what you're probably used to if you're dealing with like a SonicWall or Fortinet or WatchGuard type product when it comes to the security features. So that would be another differentiator there for us. Um, I hope that helps. We're also putting on some dedicated Nebula webinars. I believe our next one's in March. Um, so again, you can drop me an email and I can send you the registration link for that. So you can sign up for that if you'd like to know a little bit more about the Nebula cloud solution. Thank you. Uh, kind of going off on the cloud process, Jesse asks, where is ISO cloud data stored? Okay, let's also do this question next after that. Okay. Um, so when it comes to the cloud, we our cloud is hosted in AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, probably the most reliable cloud platform that's out there. Um, when it comes to the data, though, almost there's almost no data that's stored in the cloud except for the logging information. So there's no user data or anything like that. You can absolutely use Nebula for a PCI-based solution or a HIPAA solution. Um, same thing, if you want to email me, I can send you a list of all the different privacy certifications and stuff that we comply with. This solution is rolled out globally. Um, so places like Canada, places like the EU have some really strict privacy guidelines that we have to follow, and we do follow all of those, regardless of whether you're a U.S.-based customer or a European-based customer or an Asian-based customer. Another question for Sean is, Walter asks, looking at the Nebula demo site, what is the difference between control center and orchestrator? Okay, so that's a good question. So when, when I'm talking about Nebula, here where, for managed services, I'm really talking about Nebula Control Center. Um, I, I just slim it down to Nebula just to keep it simple. Um, so Nebula Control Center is our uh, cloud management monitoring platform that you use to manage your network. The Nebula Cloud Orchestrator is a separate solution at the moment um, that is for our SD-WAN products. So if you're doing SD-WAN, uh, the Nebula Orchestrator is the interface you use to be able to create that SD-WAN interface easily uh, when you've got these large customers where you're trying to VPN them all together and trying to provide some advanced QoS services. That's what Orchestrator is for. Eventually, the two will be merged into one, but for the moment, um, they're two separate uh, websites. Thank you. Another question is kind of going off on competitors wise, how do we compare against Sonic Wall? Okay, hi Richard. Um, that's a really broad question. Um, and we've got a different lines up of products for that. So we've got the Nebula security gateways, which are our Nebula managed gateways. We've also got other series of security appliances, our Zywall series, um, our USG, Unified Security Gateway Series, and our new ATP, which is our new Security Gateway Series um, that has sandboxing type support, higher throughputs on the UTM. So we've got a variety of products and it, you know, we really need to sort of drill down as to what, which SonicWell products do you want us to compare against. But as a general rule, um, I believe our primary differences when dealing with SonicWell is there's no support contracts. So you get firmware updates and you get, again, live phone support out of our U.S. office here in Anaheim. Um, there's no service contracts you have to buy to get access to that. You just call in. Um, and as a general rule, when you look at total cost of ownership, we should have a significant cost savings. Uh, when you compare us at a, you know, a three-year, I believe, breakout window. So when you compare the cost of buying the equipment and three years worth of licenses, I believe we're generally around 40% or more um, affordable. Uh, part of that's obviously since we're not charging uh, support service contracts, but some of it's just the overall cost. The other differences is when we talk about our UTM, so Unified Threat Management, 
So for those that aren't familiar with the term, that's your antivirus, content filtering, things like that. Um, rather than do it in-house, what SonicWall does, um, we actually have partnered with people that are really great in the industry and have them provide that. So our antivirus signatures, they come from Bitdefender. If you're doing content filtering, category-based content filtering, application-based rules, um, we get those signatures from a company called Siren. Um, and my mind's going blank on the other one guy that we're using out there for stuff, but we, we uh, that, that's what we do. Instead of trying to do it all in-house like SonicWall does, we get that from some of the top industry leaders in those fields and integrate that into our UTM products. Um, and then just lastly, when talking about the NSG, which is the Nebula Security Gateway, um, they're really designed for a simple streamlined interface. So if you're looking for something, you find SonicWall is a little bit too complex, a little bit, you know, too granular uh, for what you're looking to do, the NSG series, the Nebula version is a really nice way of providing that high level security with an interface that's simple and easy to use and is probably good for most of your accounts. But if you do need those higher levels of configuration, the higher level of feature set, we do have the uh, Zywall ATP and USG lines of products also. Thank you, Sean. I have a question for Carl. Uh, Corey says, I believe you stated that the managed services should never be given away for free. What are your thoughts regarding offering a brief period of free monitoring without remediation and then showing an on-the-fence client the report of what was discovered to prove they need the service? Well, uh, yeah, so uh, I think it was a, I, I said don't give away your RMM for free, um, which is true. Certainly you wouldn't give away your managed services for free. Uh, in terms of the monitoring, uh, man, I'm I'm a little reluctant to install my tool on all of those desktops and pay a you know dollar dollar fifty a desktop. I guess you'd be more in the dollar range, but um, and and then have the client say you know as soon as you did this the printer broke and you know those things happen right it was completely random nothing that we do on an RMM is gonna break your printer, but the client doesn't know that, right? So I, I would be a little reluctant for that. If you think you're almost there, then by all means, um, you know, it might be a, a tack that's worth taking. But remember, you gotta install it, and then you're gonna be making a lot of stuff visible, and then you gotta un un uninstall all of it. So I would even, for something like that, I'd charge them something, some minimal fee, just say, look, for 30 days, I'll install this for whatever, 200 bucks, um, just so you see what we're able to see. But the reality is, I don't think most clients would be convinced by that. You know, people make decisions based on emotion and on whether or not they like you and trust you. Um, and, you know, if they think that you're a trustworthy kind of person, then they believe that you are actually going to go ahead and, and monitor all their stuff and fix it. So personally, that's not a, a attack I would take. Okay. Another question from Mark is, what is your recommendation for moving current clients from a break fix model to an MSP model? <laughs> well, I have, you know, whole classes on that. But um, again, I think the, 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 if you boil it down, the, the what I call the managed services two-step, uh, first, you need to get them agreeing to monitoring and maintenance and, you know, keeping track of everything. And obviously, there's a charge for that. So, once they get used to paying that, then it makes much more sense to follow the outline that's in the book, which is to say, look, you've been paying this, 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 this. We're moving to this other system where instead of having the bills go up and down, up and down, you know, they're very predictable uh, over time. But I think you got to do that minimum uh, bit of monitoring and not just uh, let them think that, that the service is going to be unchanged and it's only the billing that's going to change. I hope that that all makes sense. Matt asks, what differentiates service levels? For example, there's a low level, which is updates, remote maintenance, antivirus, middle tier, like updates and remote service, and then higher levels, which includes all of that, 
but on-site maintenance included? What, what kind of differentiates these service levels? Good question. So I think the biggest mistake people make when they put together their three-tiered price list is that they have three distinct values and, and they, they work really hard to have that middle value be something that stands on its own and is worthwhile. There is massive research that if you give people two options, they're going to pick the cheaper one. And if you give them three options and, they're, and the middle one is strategic, then they're overwhelmingly going to choose the top option. So in terms of value, the entry level needs to have its own value. It needs to be something like monitoring only. Or in my case, I had silver be covering servers only because it's the most fundamental thing. Everybody, and, and it's probably not the first choice today because of the cloud, but 15 years ago, everybody knew that their server was valuable, so everybody wanted to cover it, right? Today, I would say that, you know, maybe you wanna look at monitoring as your silver level, monitoring and, and patch management. Um, and that has true value. And then the platinum needs to be as much as you can cover. You're, you know, it's gonna be network monitoring and maintenance. You're gonna cover the servers. You're gonna cover uh, vendor management, right? You're gonna, you know, basically, the maintenance of everything that they've got. Um, and so that's pretty high level. So then how do you get the gold to be something that looks good, but is almost platinum? And that's where the key to success. Is. That's where you literally have to spend time looking at what can you take out of that? Like take out from platinum, take out the printers, take out the vendor management, take out um, maintenance, you know, managing the relationship with the ISP, uh, take out on-site support, take out after hours support, you know, uh, so that for basically $10 a desktop less, they can go to gold, but they lose so much value that people look at it and they say, uh, I've got 20 users and at $10 a desktop, that's 200 bucks a month. I might as well just go to platinum. So that's what I mean when I say do it strategically. Define the entry level, define the platinum level, and then strategically create a gold offering uh, that allows people to sell themselves on the platinum uh, service. Great, thank you, Carl. I have a question for Sean. Diego asks, is Nebula compliant with regulations on different verticals like retail payments, PCI, and healthcare, HIPAA? Uh, yeah. Um, you can use our entire Nebula solution as part of a PCI or HIPAA compliant solution. Um, you can, you can, uh, I'm trying to think what I say here. Um, but yeah, it does, it does work with both of those. Um, depending on who's doing your PCI scan and how they're doing the scan, you mean, may need to um, open a ticket with us at the moment for us to turn off one feature that certain PCI scans don't like. Uh, but it's just a matter of opening a ticket in the interface and asking us to do that for you. But yeah, otherwise everything is, works just fine as part of PCI or HIPAA, as well as a bunch of other ones that are out there. Sure. I have another question from Walter. He asks, are these cloud managed devices reliant on a subscription basis like Cisco, Meraki's, such as that without an active license or do they become a brick like a in that aspect okay so our nebula cloud platform is actually free uh, it's lifetime free service in the cloud so there's no subscription required to use the basic service the basic service gets you access to all of the the features that you would expect to have so full management of the devices themselves unlimited number of devices in the cloud um, you can have up to five different admin and those are granular admins based on a cut per customer basis that you can have set up, um, a number of features like that. And then we do also offer a paid version, which is known as a Nebula Professional Pack. So the Nebula Professional Pack unlocks some additional features such as um, letting you go from a, having a week's worth of log information stored in the cloud to a year's worth of uh, log information stored in the cloud, unlimited number of administrators, um, for each of your customers. Um, automatic topology, network topology generation, where we'll automatically create a network map of all the equipment that's on the network. 
some other features like that. So a lot of our users don't use Pro Pack, they just use the free version. So if you're using the professional pack, you can buy that as an annual license. You can buy it as a perpetual license, so a one-time fee. Um, if you go with the annual license and you decide after that year that you don't need to renew it, it simply falls back to the free version. So you don't lose access to any of your customers. You don't lose access to the ability to configure any of the devices that you have. Um, you just lose access to some of the, those bonus features that you may or may not need. Thank you, Sean. I have a question for Carl. Uh, this person asks, how do you usually charge? Is it per user versus per device? Well, I've done both. The, um, the per user is probably the easiest way to get started in terms of counting noses and so forth. But at the end of the day, uh, you can price your per user to be about the same. Uh, if you think about, like I love selling what I call the cloud five pack, which is up to five licenses for all of this you know, bundle of services. And that is, you know, even though I sell it in a five pack, I sell it as five users. It's a per user uh, model. The last many service business I owned, we went to per user pricing. And basically, we had we looked at um, the variables of how old is the equipment, how complicated is the network, that kind of stuff, and came out, depending on the client, of somewhere between 100 to 120 $25 per user per month. And, you know, that turned out to be almost exactly the same as the per device pricing. And it's a little easier to manage in the days of cloud services because if you, let's say you're bundling Office 365, you know, they, they have this kind of five devices per user maximum, which only power users ever need. But, you know, you've got the, the, the pricing based on that. And then, most of the people, most of the employees, they got one device. They, they're not allowed to put email on their phone or take it home or use a laptop. And so it's only the power users that are, are using all the devices. So per user is actually another way that you can squeeze a little extra money out of this because especially if you sell in five packs, you have unused licenses that folks are paying for. Uh, it gives them flexibility and it gives you, again, a lot of reliable uh, revenue. So I've gone both ways and um, depending on the client, I would choose in some cases per device. Uh, if you support a call center, for example, you definitely want to go with the per device pricing because they might have 300 machines, but uh, they only have so many in use at any given time and their users have massive turnover. <laughs> um, on the other hand, if you got somebody that's got 10 people and they haven't had a new employee in, you know, seven years. Uh, there's very little turnover and uh, the per user model works really great in that environment. So you can offer both and none of this prevents you from adding on additional service for a line of business server or extra equipment that is outside of the core offering. Thank you, Carl. I have a question for Sean. How does Nebula compare with Cisco Meraki cloud networking platform? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, if you're familiar with Cisco Meraki, it's a very similar system to Nebula. Um, I think the last question I had for me was probably one of our biggest differentiators between us and Meraki um, in that we don't require an annual subscription to be able to configure the devices. We have a, by default a free, free solution uh, in the Nebula cloud and we offer the uh, the uh, extra services as an additional fee and it always will just fall back. So you never lose access to the devices themselves. In general, we're going to cost a lot less, both on the hardware and on the licenses. Um, for instance, um, you know, MSRP on a uh, one year, one access point pro pack license is going to cost you around 35 to $40 where with Meraki, you're probably looking 150 to 200 per AP. Uh, I know sometimes they have some sales a little bit better than that, but that seems to be the general price point, just, just to use that as a point of reference. Um, we don't offer cameras. I know Meraki offers cloud-based cameras. We just offer access points, uh, switches, and gateways as part of our cloud-based solution. 
Um, and then the other difference is, you know, Meraki hosts their own cloud with shards. Um, we don't do that. We're using the AWS platform, um, which we find to be a lot more reliable, a lot less issues with shards. You know, we don't have the issue with shards going down, um, things like that. But if you've used Meraki, um, Nebula is very similar to that. Um, they were certainly, when we were coming up with our solutions, probably our, our gold reference as to um, the type of features, the type of functionality and ease of use that we wanted to have on our Nebula platform. Thank you, Sean. A uh, question for Carl is from Mark. He asked, how do you get the 10,000 per month client if you're starting a MSP business? How do you get to 10 users a month? Uh, a thousand per month client, I believe. Oh, that is the question. Oh, a thousand a month. Well, so if you're just, here's what's interesting that you're going to go sell somebody your services, right? So, um, you know, as there, there's an old saying, it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich man as a poor man, right? So go only talk to clients who have 10 users and above. Only talk to people who can afford your services. You know, if you have, if you go talk to people, you know, in small business who are sole proprietors, you know, a lawyer who doesn't even hire an assistant, he, his top line revenue isn't high enough for him to have an extra money to, to give you $1,000 a month, right? But if you go to a business that's got 10 employees and they have a little insurance office or something like that, they do have enough extra revenue to be able to pay for somebody to main their, maintain their systems. And that's why, you know, I said that earlier, right? You, you don't have to take everybody's money and you are not required to service every computer you see. So go talk to people who have 10 or more users. I used to put on events from time to time where Microsoft would come to town and I was a Microsoft partner. So every once in a while we'd do something or I'd have a booth at the, and the local networking or chamber and I would literally put up a sign that would say something to the effect of, if you have 10 or more computers, uh, we can probably save you money on tech support. And nobody came and talked to me if they had three computers. And I only talked to people who could afford my services. So go talk to businesses that have enough employees. And, you know, another one of my favorite marketing techniques is direct mail. And I know that's expensive, but you can go for 25 cents a name, go on to Info USA and do a search for businesses in your area that are in whatever your niche is. And, and just check the box that says 10 or more employees, or you could even say 10 to 25. So you can only go focus your attention on people who are that size and they will just naturally uh, have enough money to pay you what it takes for you to build your business on them. So, you know, I, I encourage you to not spend time talking to people who are too small to give you enough money for you to build your business. Thank you, Carl. I have a couple of questions regarding the, the goodies. Uh, I know we're kind of getting off the time here. We'll probably do a hard stop at 1230. But if people need to go, we'll be shipping the books out to you. And everyone that at least attended the webinar for 30 minutes would be given a $10 Amazon gift card. So maybe to purchase more of Carl's products or books. There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, but, and the, the book has their downloads that accompany the book. So uh, it tells you to go to register that book. And when it says, you know, show your receipt or whatever, just put Zeitzel in that box. And, uh, the, you know, my assistant will know that you attended this webinar. Okay. Um, on top of that, also, people, uh, attendees that came to this webinar will also be put into a pool of a $1,000 Amazon gift card. Um, just letting you know. And I guess we can answer a couple more questions here. Let me just see. And if you win that, you, you that can, Amazon, if you win $1,000, you can buy all my books and have money left over. 
<laughs> to buy Nebula products. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Carl, do you see anything on your end uh, that you want to answer? Um, I I Just, haven't been flipping through all of the questions, but um, you know I I do appreciate all this. And you know you guys can always connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, and I'm I'm happy to answer questions there. Um, there is a Small Biz Thoughts page on Facebook, so uh, if you want to post up questions there or put them on my blog or whatever. Okay, um, so I guess we're, we're, we're calling it a quit here. If we haven't gotten to your questions, if they're Nebula related, my email's there on the screen. Um, just, just email me and, and I'll get you the answer or put you in touch with somebody if you can. Um, if you can't see it for some reason, it's, it's Sean R. Sean is spelled S-H-A-W-N. And then just the letter R like Romeo at Zycel.com. And uh, thanks everyone for turning out. I hope you got answered most of your questions. I hope most of you, uh, found this beneficial, either Carl's portion or my portion, at least some of it. All righty. Thank you all. All right. Thank you.